God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become so much better than the angels so much better than the angels I'm waiting so much better than this is for my prophetic friends so much better than the angels by the way if you want angels in your life glorify Jesus if you want to run them off glorify them as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they I felt the Lord begin to speak to me this afternoon uh, in my room this morning about Jesus and who he is to us For him to be who he is supposed to be to us, it helps us to see who Jesus is to the Father. In the New Testament, the Father only preached one sermon. This is my son. So what I'd like to say as part of unapologetically part of revival charismatic Christianity unapologetically I am a Holy Spirit man it is impossible to know Jesus outside of the Holy Spirit I will not apologize for the sick being healed will not apologize for signs and wonders even the ones I don't understand I will never apologize for the move of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that nobody can be saved outside of the work of the Spirit? It is impossible to even see Jesus outside the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the Holy Spirit's chief objective and role on earth. To turn the hearts of God's people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And to reveal him to the lost. This is the chief objective, as I said. Chief role, chief mission. It is his delight, by the way, of the Holy Spirit. So I want to say what I'm going to say with all of that that I just said as the backdrop. <laughs> that was the Novocaine. That was the anesthesia for the surgery. We've, in many cases, traded the revelation of his blood for portals or realms or even the angelic. It's not to say that that's all bad. But to disconnect anything from Jesus is to create an idol. That's why I gave you the Novocaine. Hebrews and Colossians were actually written for this reason primarily. Because the church had turned its affections to the supernatural and away from Jesus not realizing that the supernatural lives in him. 
I've had the joy, I own some of uh, Catherine Kuhlman's uh, personal items. My father-in-law has a ton of them. Obviously, we've, as a family, been deeply impacted by Catherine. And one day, I was with my father-in-law reading through her personal letters to the Lord. And what blew me away was her focus on the Lord Jesus. Every letter she wrote began like this. Dearest Jesus. My father-in-law actually owns her copy of the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Which if you haven't read it, I would encourage everyone here to read that book. Catherine said it was the only book she ever read outside the Bible. It's a mandatory read at Jesus School. It's called the Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's, a, it's just a, a compilation of accounts of those who gave their lives for Jesus. In Catherine's copy, on the, the inside of the cover, on the cover page, she writes, Dearest Jesus, grant me the privilege of giving my life for you as these wonderful saints have. When you saw Catherine on the platform, it was very easy to maybe think that her head was elsewhere. But Catherine knew the secret, and so did Oral, Oral Roberts. He was a dear friend of mine. I used to sit there at his house in uh, Newport Beach. And his simplicity frustrated me. No matter what I asked him, he would give me the same answer. And this was the answer. You need to meet Jesus. We used to call him Doc. So I, the first time I went, by the way, I, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an offering. To him to honor him. I'll never forget it. He opened it right in front of me and stared at the number. It was the most awkward feeling in the world. I said, oh Lord, it's all I have. I hope he thinks this is a lot. I think it's a lot. He stared at it, folded it, put it in his pocket and told me to sit down. I sat there with him as a discouraged preacher who had 40 to 50 people in my church. Maybe there's some of you here. By the way, the size of the church has nothing to do with God's pleasure. I said the size of our ministries have nothing to do with God's pleasure. His presence is everything. So I was discouraged. Everyone I prayed for would not, I would say I, I, half a percent of the people I prayed for in those days would get healed. I would preach my guts out and nobody would get saved. And uh, I told our staff that our church uh, whatever, our church slogan should be this. If you want to stay sick and stay a sinner, we are the church for you. I even said maybe we should name this church Miracle Free Christian Center. <laughs> I told our staff another day, I said, we're a mega church, mega small. And dead. And so in those days, I would... I would fast and pray and go anywhere where God was moving. And to be honest, I really didn't come here to preach. I really didn't. I, I do often do that, but I came here to worship the Lord with you because I'm hungry for a touch from God. I have to have more of God. I don't know if you've looked at the world lately, but we need more. We've got to do more than grow our schools and ministries and YouTube followings and all that, which I guess has its place, but we actually have to begin driving disease out of people consistently. These are the real issues in the world today. And, and the church is to be empowered on that level. And I, I came saying, Lord, I, I, need, I need a touch from heaven this week. That's why I came. I hope that's why you came as well. So I, I, I went to sit with Oral and, oh, we're in Oklahoma. Wow. I usually don't share this story very much. So he said, sit down. So I sat down in the recliner. He's a very tall man and uh, very intimidating. He said, come closer. So I scooted an inch closer. 
He said, closer. So I was like, by this time, I'm like right here. And he's staring a hole through my head. He had those laser-like eyes. He said, uh, and I had my Bible ready, ready to learn. I said, Doc, I read my Bible and I look at my life and they are miles apart. I look at the life of Jesus and I look at the life of the disciples in my life and these lives are miles apart. What am I missing? Can you lay your hands on me? He said, uh, you need to meet Jesus. I thought he didn't believe I was born again. So I said, no, 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 no. I don't think you heard the question, doc. I, I met Jesus when I was 12. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. You need to meet Jesus again. Then he looked me in the eye and said, can you give me a golf lesson? Because that was my former profession. I thought, oh my gosh, this meeting's going horribly. <laughs> I brought him an offering and now I have to give him a golf lesson. And I actually did. Has anyone here heard the name Rex Humbard? Rex Humbard was the pastor of the Cathedral of Tomorrow in Akron, Ohio. He was the first person to give Catherine Kuhlman her a tent to use. It seated 6,000 people and 18,000 showed up there in Akron for Catherine's first meeting. His wife, Maud Amy, who's gone on to be with the Lord, they both have, played organ for Catherine in her meetings. And my father-in-law used to take care of Rex in his old age, financially. And so Jessica and I would have the joy of going to meet with him. And so I said, I'm going to take Rex out for lunch. And I'm going to ask him the same questions I asked Dr. Roberts. Hopefully he'll give me the 10-step formula to break through. So there we were at Chili's. He loved Chili's. I don't know why. Now, if you own a Chili's, God bless you. We love it. But he, he really loved it. And I said, uh, Pastor Rex, nothing's happening in my ministry. What do I do? He said, Jesus calls a man. And I thought, what does that mean? He said, you need Jesus. <laughs> Here we go again. You know, it's kind of like when uh, Philip walks up to the Lord and says, Lord, the Greeks want to meet with you. Remember when the Greeks said, sirs, we wish to see Jesus and Jesus' response leaves them dumbfounded. Imagine poor Philip. Jesus says, unless a kernel of grain go into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it shall bear much fruit. Could you imagine Philip going, they just wanted to say hi. What did that mean? That's kind of like how I used to sit at those tables. So you need to meet Jesus. And then I met this group of sisters, evangelical, charismatic sisters. That there was a sisterhood founded by a woman named Basilia Schlink. They came to meet with my father-in-law and I fell in love with them because their eyes were glowing with the light of the Spirit. And, and in, in this Bible, I have all these wonderful notes from all these wonderful servants of the Lord, from Reinhardt and my father-in-law and... Uh, you name it, Bill and Ralph Wilkerson and just champions, Brother Copeland, all these amazing people. So I took my Bible to Sister Rebecca who was sitting there in the green room. I said, Sister, I have notes written from friends of the Lord in my Bible. I would like to give this to one of my kids one day. Would you just sign my Bible? I was actually on my knees because she was sitting in a chair. She's gone on to be with the Lord as well. I said, Sister Rebecca, would you sign the Bible? 
She said, oh, sweetie. I can't sign your Bible. Your Bible is signed by God. I'm on my knees at that point. And I just got up. I said, okay, I'm going to go bury myself somewhere and get out of the way. She said, come see me in Phoenix. So I drove to Phoenix, five hours. And they had a table set for me and a little tea and some toast. And I shared the same story that I shared with Dr. Roberts and Pastor Rex. I said, nothing's happening. I said, I'm a pastor now, but I feel called one day to be an evangelist. I feel like I'm supposed to start a ministry one day. And they would say one thing to me. You need to meet Jesus. I said, I, said, you don't, you, I don't think you have, you didn't hear the question. How do I start a ministry? This is what she told me. Find the love of Jesus and love him back. How do I heal the sick? Find the love of Jesus and love him back. Her simplicity, listen carefully, exposed my adultery, my spiritual adultery, my spiritual mixture. The bride, listen carefully now, the bride does everything with the groom in mind. So to say we love Jesus actually looks like something. It actually feels like something. It's measurable. Billy Graham said, show me your checkbook and your calendar and I'll tell you about your walk with God. I felt to share this this morning because, or this afternoon, because I just had the picture in my room that there were discouraged Christians here. Looking for the next, I don't know, bit of advice. And the Father has one thing to say forever. This is Jesus.